team in this one. So guys, we have one minute to the start. We just heard the horn in the background there. So look at that spread again, a little bit of space to the pin, but much more evenly spread uh, down the course than the last race, which tells me that this line might be a little bit more even, much less bias. 30 seconds to go now. And there's always a little bit of that midline sag, but uh, I tell you, everyone looks right up on the line, like at least in line with each other. Yes, but there's more spread. Uh, there's more boats towards this lured end, towards the left hand. There's enough leverage to get a good speed yeah. build. There's a the little bit of a sag there in the middle. Actually, quite a big sag down. Coming up to the start, second race of the day, the finals, NACRA 17. It looks like we'll be clear. It always, it always impresses me that it's that little sag. You get so nervous when you're far away from the ends of the line to, to really punch out. And sometimes it's a boat length, right, in the middle of the line. The old eye. It's when the, your eye deceives you. <laughs> so we did hear one extra hoot in the background there from the start boat, so it may be an individual recall there. Um, you've got the Australian teams uh, right there up on your screen. So these guys have got heaps of space. So we'll be watching to see if they can push right out off that start line, but nobody yet to tack. Um, only a few guys that are in that second row have pulled out, but we're neck and neck here, bow to bow, uh, straight off this start line. Looks like Gimson. The other thing I'd like to see here is the, the, the teams that were up there and had a not so great race. I want to see if they gave it, you know, pushed the start really hard and tried to, wanted to make a difference here. Who do we have um, right up here? Is Wilkinson? That's that's Darmanin. Yeah, Darmanin yeah. and Copeland on your screen there. These guys um, are one of the more young Australian teams, but they have been in the class now for two Olympic cycles. Um, look at the space there and they're really trying to leg out. You know, the key here is that these guys have to uh, get further enough bow forward so that when they do tack, they're not at the mercy of all of the starboard tackers there. So these guys uh, are really trying to um, make that space and try to fit in that tack and cross. The boat uh, directly above them, you've got France 56 a little bit, who's fallen off uh, the pace there a little bit. They're getting that dirty air. But you've got um, Lynn St. Holt and CP Lubeck, Denmark 71, who are that next um, boat up from the pin. So they're doing really well to hold their height. A little bit of pressure um, on, from, on from some of the boats uh, around them, particularly Outeridge and Outeridge, which is the boat uh, directly above them. So that's our uh, little group here off the pin. And we're seeing uh, the French team uh, make that tack out. You know, look at them suffer there in that dirty air. There is no wind behind these boats in that turbulent, uh, dirty air. It's nice to see the finish uh, still kind of up there. I know it's early days with this line because one little shift can send a whole half of the fleet to the back. But, the, uh, but Kerpe and Keskinen you know, got in the top, I think they were in the top five in that last race, and then they won the race before that yesterday. I think it's wonderful to see them just keeping that hot streak alive. And let, let's see who just comes back up. We got Nathan and Haley Outeridge uh, just showing right now. Again, it's early days, but it's nice to see them consistently up at the top. They're having a great day. Yeah, and you're seeing a few boats, uh, even if they have had to make that tack off onto port, there's a bit of urgency for these guys to get themselves back onto starboard. So that's telling me uh, that there might be a little bit of a wind shift here. They've definitely, the fleet is definitely favouring uh, the starboard tack right now. It's only now that we're seeing about uh, one fifth of the fleet that are getting off onto port tack now. Yeah, I think if you've got a lane, the, the boats are hanging on and going left to starboard. It's, I think it might be a bit of a pressure thing going on. But then that becomes the dilemma as you get up towards ley line. When, when can I come back? And, and I'm, then I am the giveaway boat on port. If Once the tack complete, I've got to duck or try and get bow forward on the boats to windward. So it's a real uh, a, a tactical dilemma. You, know, you start down towards the pin end and you push forward. Can we get advanced enough to tack and cross the fleet? And these guys will be 100% dialed in to what they can and can't do with a good tack. 
the problem is in the real world that they're not always, you know, that perfect tack. And so these guys will be eyeing off. I always remember as a crew, I'd be like, if we get a perfect tack, we can cross. But, you know, we uh, can't always expect to, to have that perfect world of tack. You can see a little bit of um, water, a bit of movement and the water there on your screen. You know, it's perfectly flat, but there can be a few tricky positions to tricky spots in that swell to, to tack into. Good Ooh. shot there. You've got Lynn and CP in the front of your screen. And I'm pretty sure it's Adderidge and Adderidge, uh, just one ladder rung above. These guys have been keeping it nice and tight off that start line. Oh, no, I stand corrected. It's McKay and Saunders, uh, New Zealand 42, just to windward of them. Um, so one of the Australian teams must have tacked off a little bit earlier. But you can see the split there along the fleet. And again, we're getting to that stage where these guys are making that tack onto port now uh, towards the top of your screen. I did want to mention uh, Olivia Mackay and Jason Saunders. Um, they're... They're really duking it out with Micah Wilkinson and his crew from New Zealand. Micah used to be Olivia's crew. They won the first ever foiling generation sponsored by Red Bull. Uh, you know, like a really, really telling thing for teams to try to get ready for when it was the um, Catamaran America's Cup. But it's really nice to see, uh, I guess, Liv Mackay uh, up, up in the front with her crew. Again, another one of the countries that is uh, just all those sailors from New Zealand and the NACRA 17 are fighting for Olympic selection and they've all got a shot. And then the selectors will have to make a decision whether they actually even send someone. But I think if they have, as a group, a strong world championship here in Geelong and that's the way it's stacking up, um, they, the selectors, it would be hard not to take... To, to make the selection. Very interesting crosses up on your screen here. You've got those boats that were furthest out to the left, um, Paul and Lucy. Um, they've made that tack and a few tricky ducks there and then CP and Lynn as well taking a few sterns. So it is that boat, that pack that was just to windward of um, the, the pin end pack that have come out quite strong. And to keep you updated with what's happening on the other side of the course, the furthest right boat is the, it's actually the two Austrians, um, Zajac and Matt's Austria 3. They're currently most leveraged out to the right hand side. Uh, we just don't know which way it's going to go. And they're out there with their teammates. Um, Austria 391. So this group over in the left now of TAC, they look quiet. Looks, it look, doesn't look to be a lot of wind over on the left. Look over towards the right and they certainly the image, it looks a little bit, if my eye is picking it, I think they're a little bit more pressure at the moment on the right, although if this left-hand group get uh, nice pressure as we look there at out the Nathan Outeridge and Hayley Outeridge from Australia, uh, the windward boat, They've got a good lane, good... They're not going to be affected by the Kiwis down to lure to them. That's Michael Wilkinson. The fleet is m way more evenly spread out than the last race. I mean, everyone is head-to-head -head right now, so any little shift is going to make it. You can see right now the Austrians on the right that were looking on the leaderboard just ahead. You can see, look, if you look at the boats that just tacked on the left on the tracker, you can tell right now just it's just starting to show up that that group is just starting to gain an advantage. You can tell just by looking at it straight across the course. I want to say this pack on our screen here that they have the angle, but the other side of the, of the course looks like they have a little bit more pressure. Right. They just got a little bit more boat speed over there so again you just don't know do you these guys are all making um gambles and, and estimated guesses out there and also with you know we tend to look at the tracker a lot i think when there's a lot of leverage between a, a group right on the right and in the left it takes very little pressure difference or angle difference and you'll see a different result yeah. uh, for my eye until the boats actually get closer together you really don't make a definitive decision of uh, what group but what you will know is one group the left or the right hand group will be dominant um, and it's uh, as it plays out who, who's it going to be the, uh, you get the impression the, the dilemma for the group coming across from the right will be I don't think any of that group if they're on starboard are on ley line. So that immediately they're going to have to do two extra tacks. Right. Uh, the group coming in on port, as long as they can weave the needle through the starboard hand boats, they've got one tack to do to the top mark. So it becomes a, a, you know, you know, a, a strategic decision of minimising your tacks 
mm. keeping a lane and hopefully let the wind gods keep you in pressure. So we're on board here now with Riley Gibbs and Anna Weiss. You can see there how um, tricky some of the crewing can be. So the crews are now getting uh, laying nearly alongside that spinnaker pole, as you can see there, um, and that really centres the weight, but it also gets the bows or uh, well, the stern out of the water a little bit. We're seeing this technique more and more. Puts the pressure on the skipper, you know. You can see, uh, I've been up there, you can see a few things, but you can't see a whole lot. You know, your vision's quite limited. So all of a sudden the skipper's trimming the main sheet and um, kind of having to make those big decision calls uh, on his own while the crew's just kind of that body weight and a, you can see a few little cheeky pumps in there as well. Coming into this weather mark, and you can see again on the tracker, this is going to be a lot different than the last race. It's going to be really condensed. And as we know, this is in any kind of racing, this isn't a high performance thing. There are certain people, the way their mind works is they can look at that fleet and map out their path of least resistance and leverage off of other boats, pinning people, hooking someone on their weather side and getting through and around that weather mark in, a, in an efficient way. And there are some people that just go and see what happens when you get there. And it just, it's just the way the mind works. And it, we're going we're gonna to see a perfect example of that right now. There may be one or two boats that pop out ahead, but then there's going to be a big crunch. And it's those who planned five, six boat lengths away are going to be able to ones that pick up five, even ten boats in a mark round. I think uh, tax are everything here. Mm -hmm. uh, the the boats that can <laughs> pick an angle to minimise the attacks towards. And I like the positioning of uh, Outeridge actually. I, I think he, he's got one tack to do as long as he can maintain his lane all the way through to Mark One. Mm -hmm. uh, the group coming in from the right, some of them have bitten the bullet early and have tacked, and they'll go out onto lay line. Yes, yeah, so that is Bizarro, Vittorio Bizarro, and um, the Japanese team out there as well that have taken that bullet early. You can see them on your screen. I mean, you can get the whole picture right there. It's a really great graphic of these guys uh, trying to leverage um, a position for them to round into that top mark. One boat that's got really amazing wheels today, Austria 391. There is no denying that they are quick upwind. Yeah, They've, you going. can see them, Forese and Zoldig there um, coming in. They've still got two taxes to go, as we mentioned, but there is no doubt in my mind that they've got some wheels today. Yeah, I think they can go... They're going to be all right, although they've got two taxes to do the... Farazi and Zajing, they, 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 uh, they're well clear of Outeridge, so they'll go tack complete, they'll go over towards the starboard ley line and then come back, so yeah, you're right, they, they're quick, and right now they're positioned nicely, uh, they're not going to get too tied up uh, at that top mark, I think they're gonna lead, they'll, they'll lead at, the, at mark one. Coming in short of that port tack ley line is sometimes a horrible thing if there's a, a tremendous amount of starboard tackers coming. Otherwise, it's very efficient because you don't have to plan your ley line out from, you know, these are all port roundings. You don't have to plan your ley line out from a long way away. You can line it up from a very short distance once you get there. In the absence of other boats, just, just shy of the port tack ley line is one of the most efficient ways to get to the weather mark. So we're coming into the Ford Whip top mark here. Go faster on the water and it will be the Austrians. 391, Ferezi and Zolchig uh, around in first place. Uh, these guys are quick. And then it's a real fight out for that second, third and fourth place. We're going to have to watch it unfold on your screen here. But we do have um, a really close battle between Japan, Italy and then Nathan Outeridge and Haley Outeridge in there as well. Notice that they didn't change their angle very much at all when they put that kite up because they just they need to have it fully loaded up until they get to the speed that they want. Well, and the apparent wind comes crashing forward as the you know they come round, put a shoot up, speed goes up, but uh, the first three boats, second it is Bizarro and a second, and then we've got the Japanese team. Yeah, yeah everyone's setting Kuchimoto. their spinnakers on the offset mark. I guess that's what I was meaning. <laughs> they hadn't rounded the offset mark yet. But, um, but it, that shows you that the breeze is just backed enough that they can set their spinnaker on the offset. That probably means that, you know, wind angle, it's, the breeze was a little bit more to the right. And it will be Tita and Banty around in fourth place, followed by uh, Nathan and Haley Outeridge um, will just get in there as well. So we have there both Italian teams right up there duking it out. 
They're literally, every race that goes back and forth, it's smiles or frowns with those two. I was talking to Vittorio and I was surprised when I asked him if he had the other Italian team in his sights as he was racing, if, he, if a little bit of his focus was on them. Expecting him to say, no, I'm not worried about it. He turned to me, looked me in the eye and said, yep, they're <laughs> always in the back of my mind. And those guys, they've, they're switching world champions. They're switching regatta wins. Um, they've both had moments of glory um, all through the last two years, especially and I do not want to be an Italian selector, that is for sure. That will be a really difficult decision to make. Peter, in your history, when you see teams, you've seen this, and when you've seen teams that really have to beat each other, um, at this level, is there always, there always seems to be maybe a level of respect, or is there? A, it just depends oh, on the sailor. <laughs> I think, I think res, respect, but you want to you win. You want to yeah, beat them. Yeah. And... and uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, we, we've had this little discussion earlier about strong countries, building a team, building a culture, the cooperation. Right. But at some point, you, you know, you've, you've really got to stick the knife in between the ribs. And right. It's mm. being illustrated here with the Italians, with the Australians, mm. and with the Kiwis. Right. And, 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 yeah, that's where the national body have to be really strong and the coaches so that they keep the mindset of the sailors that they are cooperating yeah. but <laughs> someone's going to got to get a result on the board and right. yeah I, I think it's a it's a real uh, it's a real challenge because at some point you always get to Absolutely. get there <laughs> So watching the first move on this downwind um, be made by the Austrians out in front, they did make that first move, but these guys are all trying to find that position to jibe. We spoke about dirty air going upwind. What about dirty air going downwind? You know, these guys are kind of in the lead. You're at the mercy of the boats behind you if it's super close. Well, of course, for these things, the the, the wind shadow is a long way forward Yeah. Uh, because you're, you're dragging the apparent or the, the wind that the boat actually feels, that wind angle, a long, long way forward. So the, the shadowing effect is really out through the bottom of the uh, of the Jenica. And they all sail, you know, slightly different modes. A great example right here on your screen, uh, Vittorio um, sailing a little bit higher than the Austrians there, closing the gap, but also closing the distance as well. There's not one specific way to, to sail these boats um, and they've all got their different techniques and they've got to kind of have that in their mind before they make that break onto the jibe to ensure that they have breathing space the whole I way down. I think the thing to watch for here on these downwind legs with, with the, the way the geometry works is the role of the crew. What are they doing to keep the angle of the tack of the, the foil so that the boat keeps foiling and it doesn't rear up or, or nosedive? Right. And, and that is a really... That's something that really has evolved very, very quickly in this class. And, and it's very dynamic and there's a lot of skill and a lot of touch. And uh, right now we're seeing that with the, the leading boat just scooting away. It, that aerial footage was really great because you can see them searching. They can, they can make their steering as twitchy or as stable as they want. And just keeping it up on the foils and doing that in concert with the crew, um, it was really nice to watch that sometimes, you know, even the best sailors in the world, they're making a little quick adjustment um, because you just you have to try anything you can to stay up. Someone who's real good at it is the second boat. I, I really fancy Italy, Italy 5, Bizarro and... Fiscari, look, they're beautifully positioned. You can see their tracking line. So there's some helming calibration going on there, but generally they're sailing a little bit deeper. Now, that could be pressure, but, but I think the trend we saw it at the previous Worlds and we're seeing it here from the likes of Bizarro and the likes of Waterhouse, they have that little mode over the fleet where they can sail incredibly fast downwind. And I, I, I think here, um, we'll just have to see. It wouldn't surprise me if um, they might well have a piece of the lead by the bottom mark gate, the, the Italian combination, because... They are just chipping away, aren't when they? When the Austrians come back, you just know they'll put them in a, a compromised position of, of wind shadow and picking up the bottom mark gate. So for me, the winning of this race between first and second could well actually happen at this bottom mark gate and it's going to unfold really shortly. The one thing I can tell you is that with Vittorio Maiel in Italy 5, when we were, when we were interviewing Vittorio this morning, um, Maiel was behind the camera just dancing up a storm. 
you know, look at him, trying to get him to laugh, and it, and it actually worked. He had to stop and re-ask the question a couple times, and she was, she was rolling. So, they're, you know, for, for a team that's under a lot of pressure, they came into this day very, very relaxed. And, um, and, and it's showing. It's showing. They're well, nice what, ha- what happened there didn't actually eventuate. I, th- I expected the, uh, something uh, that uh, Bizarro would actually have a, quite a nice piece, but whether it was pressure, but the Austrians just uh, managed to wriggle around and they're, now they're in a really strong position. Yeah. Yep, they put their heads down, put their jibe in, and, and it could have been it. pressure, though. You pick, you know, pick your time, jibe when there's a little bit of wind on you, so that. Uh, Another bit of a shake-up in these results is that uh, Outerage and Outerage got kind of jibed on by one of the New Zealand teams, and that's um, they've taken a bit of a hit. They didn't quite get that clear lane going uh, into that last downwind here as we've got our leaders rounding this first top mark, Austria 391, Ferrezi and Zoltig. These guys are unstoppable at the moment. Yeah, they're on fire. Mark, that was mark two, bottom gate. Then next in, it'll be current world champions. Interesting. Both of them like uh, looking down the wind, the, the left-hand gate. A lot closer than the last race, and, and part of that is because whatever, whatever Vittorio and Mael came, came down with on that side of the course has leveled up the downwind leg, so there wasn't one side that seemed pretty dominant in that downwind leg. Oh, they had to leg. dip there to, get, to there. get round behind. Beautiful front on um, view of these guys coming into the bottom mark. We get a front row seat to this drop yeah. as these guys jive around. Everyone is choosing to take that right hand gate um, at the bottom mark here. Tita and Benti, then. Yeah, it will oh, be Japan. That's a, painful, then. that's a painful mark rounding. If those two Italians are going to be this close together, the rest of the regatta, I'm going to have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> I think on the first upwind, and, uh, the, the group that ended up strong came out of, of the right, and I just wonder if now we're not seeing the, the cavalcade of boats wanting to um, do that extra jibe, bottom mark gate right. to go right. So we've got Mika Wilson and Erica Dawson rounding now in fifth spot. These guys are on fire. They're the top New Zealand team in the standings overall, uh, coming into the day in seventh place. And then we've got GBR21, Gibson and Burnett. Um, the nice little recovery from that last race for these guys into a bit of a keeper it's uh, very position expensive. there. It's very expensive to do these 180 turns, so that right side of the course must be really, really strong. The, yeah, you know, you sort of think you're going to pay, you, you're going to take a little bit of pain to get a gain mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. later on on the upwind, but the, the, it's become a, a, a bit one dimensional. Team that have missed out here would be um, Nathan Outeridge. He was up in the hunt. And, yes. Uh, he has dropped back. I watched a little bit of a jostle, a jostle with him and um, Mika Wilkinson and Erica Dawson on the downwind. I think they got a little bit of dirty air, but they are opting to take the opposite gate here. So a little bit of um, a different, you know, angle for these guys. They're going to be trying to get some well, clear air, get their speed up, and have a crack. I think the game within the game yeah. Yeah, for Australian Olympic selection because Waterhouse is ahead of uh, Outeridge at the moment. So Waterhouse and uh, have I got that right? No, I might have misread that. No, no, I haven't. Waterhouse is deep. Yeah, I picked he's up one of the a... uh, I picked up one of the Kiwi graphics. So Waterhouse is back in 30 seconds. So that's very strong for um, Nathan and Haley Outeridge in terms of their selection. Sometimes a little bit of clear air is all you need to put yourself back, um, reset, and put yourself back in the game. We'll, well de- that line of boats that are all heading out towards. The um, the right looking up wind is if you're at the back of the pack you're you're getting a lot of uh, disturbed wind. Right, and it is difficult. And a lot if that's really as obvious as it looks like on the tracker right now, that long port tack that there's no such thing as what we would call a clearing tack. You know, if you're in a line of boats and you just want a little bit better air and you still want to go in that direction to take tack out on the starboard and then tack right back, it's uh, it's not really an option in light air in a catamaran. Yeah, it's not. You really can't have that in your playbook, can you? <laughs> you, you can in a slower boat, but yeah. I'm afraid. Let's just do two tacks. Yeah. <laughs> Minimise your tacks. So it is also Gemma Jones and um, Josh Perebski. They're both taking that uh, left-hand gate um, and heading out to that side. So we'll have to check in, you know, closer to the top of the upwind. We might check in with Olivia right now on water uh, to see what she's made of this, of a bit of a split going on here. Olivia, are you there? What are you seeing?
Hey guys, it's um, pretty shifty out here. What I can say is that first upwind, the outsides of the course did work. Um, the sun's come out, I'm getting a little bit more of a tan out here, but it also means that the sea breeze has potential to fill in. So hopefully we'll be seeing a little bit more breeze as it settles um, throughout the afternoon. Uh, the, we had the team of Waterhouse and Darman and you were just talking about the Australian selection battle but they went up the middle of the course and obviously at the moment it, that one didn't pay so the outsides of the course worked obviously the Austrians super quick out on that right hand side and then Outeridge and Outeridge uh, continued out to this left. Anyone who went through that middle actually got um, qu quite a bit of dirty air from each other, a bit of congestion as well as just not as much breeze as this uh, light sea breeze starts to settle in. You know, at the start there was a little bit of uh, right hand shift and left hand shift and that's what we saw with the spread across the start line. It meant that not really many people um, knew exactly what was going on so there was a bit of a split breeze and we saw that as everyone trucked themselves out to the ley lines. Thanks Olivia and we just watched their uh, Outeridge and Outeridge make that crucial tack back to the pack to check in uh, to see how that left hand gate treated them. Um, obviously as Olivia was saying the edges of the course is paying that might change uh, for this next upwind because there is that little bit of less congestion the, the fleet has split, uh, spread out a little bit. We're looking there at, I think that's Nathan and Hayley Outeridge, and they look, for me, a bit quiet compared with the boats over, more over to the, the right. Yeah, it is definitely the bulk of the fleet have um, been heading out to that right-hand side with only the uh, a few of the leaders. I guess the top three or four have made a short dig up, but they're also, as soon as they can, uh, flopping back onto Port Tack, at the moment, it seems to be the, the majority. Well, it's the old game, is it? What side of the track you want to protect? And what we're seeing from the group that are in the lead, that, that whole body of boats of uh, Austria, the two, the two Italians, the Japanese and the Kiwis who make up the... Uh, that's Wilkinson and Dawson make up that top five. They're hesitant. They'll let boats get to lure to them, but they're very hesitant to, to oh, let yeah. anyone get to the right of them and they're, they're digging back and... Uh, it's certainly quite right-hand favoured at the moment. Nice little low-risk uh, manoeuvre for those guys in the lead, though. Just close the gate, close the gate, close the gauge, and make sure that they're not under risk uh, from anyone extreme on one side uh, or the other. So we've got the first cross coming up here uh, with Nathan and Haley Outeridge and John Gimson and Burnett. They're they're coming in, and it does look like GBR will have uh, a little bit of an advantage on this cross uh, as they come in together. We'll I'm, always curious. I'm always curious to see when you have such a top sailor like the Outer Ridges, when you let them loose. Even sometimes mm -hmm. it seems, let's say this was a higher pressure race, individual race near the end. It always seems like some of those really great sailors just find another gear no matter what's going on on that side of the well, course. Well, you know, you give yourself a shot and leverage can be your friend or your enemy. It's that high. It's, it's the risk reward game. Right. And, and I think for uh, out, the Outer Ridges at that bottom mark, they were really. <laughs> There was a lot of congestion ahead of them, so they elected to, to play the game. And I, I think it's worked out all right for them. Yeah. I, they certainly haven't lost, lost anything. Yeah. Yeah. And it's put them back in contention uh, with Gibson and Barnett, the GBR 21, who are just ahead of them. And watching these crews, uh, they're on their trapeze wires. They're up. They're basically putting their arms around the spinnaker snuffer and the, and the, um, and the bowsprit, and then they have to get in back into the boat and out around the backside of the spreaders to get back out. So it's a big move from being underneath underneath the spinnaker snuffer and then getting back in and back around and back and forth. And they're doing this a lot. You know, they're probably very practiced. You saw that. They, that crew just did that three times, that little pathway. Mm -hmm. It's a tremendous amount of work. As if these boats weren't hard enough, they're just as hard or maybe it seems like just even harder sometimes in the light air. Well, it's a, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of things to adjust. Mm -hmm. But I, I've got to be impressed by the Austrians. Wow, they're, yeah. they're just stamping. They're having a scorcher of a day in this, in this condition. Of course, conditions change, can change the whole dynamic. But uh, It's important to know the, um, the coach. We talked to the coach for the, the Austrian team, which is Roman Hagara. With uh, Hans Peter, uh, they they're Olympic. Not bad coaches, are they? Not <laughs> bad coaches at all. Um, they've been involved with the M32 series, the GC32 series, the Youth Americas Cup, and the foiling generation, which they helped create with Red Bull. And uh, I, I had the the fortune to sail flying Phantoms with Roman for a day, 
And and it was conditions like this where I he had me just right up forward, just hugging the spinnaker snapper, and we were doing just fine. But um, I'm but, I'm loving watching that battle on board there for the crew to keep that hull out of the water. It is a huge amount of drag, and you can just watch the crew do us doing everything they can with the available tools to keep that hull out of the water. And I think that's the biggest difference in speed. Whoever you know drops that hull in the least is going to be away. So at the top mark, or around, it is Austria 391, Faresi and Joshling who are leading. It's they, a much uh, bigger lead They than have just smoked it on that upwind. They played the right and uh, I think a combination of going the right way and they've got serious pace. Coming in next, it'll be Bizarro and Fracari. So this will be a keeper for them, but right on their tail, they've got their countrymen, Tita and Banti, and you've got to believe, you've got to believe there's a bit of in-house going on there. It will be a fight to death down to the bottom mark, I and, think, with these guys. And Peter, going back to your theory, leaving selections to the end, I mean, there's you, you light the fire under these sailors, and they're, somehow they've got more pressure than anyone else on them. Well, it's, it's the game of saying, well, what are the conditions in... in uh, in Japan, what are we going to experience and, and how often have we seen our sailors sail in those conditions in various regattas around the world? Right. To me, you, you know, and if you go to a, a regatta and it's incredibly windy and you're going to a, a light here, Olympics, you mm. want to see more. Right. If you, if you have a good regatta of a lot of replication of what you're going to see at the Olympics, you might say, well, I'm happy to sign off, but right. uh, I'm, I'm not sure if they're at that stage yet. Looking at those two teams, and like I said, uh, with Vittoria and Mayal in Italy 5, they seem both a very similar character style, very relaxed, very playful. And with Tito and Banti, um, Ruggiero is, is a pretty relaxed and, and quiet individual, and his crew seems like a very strong individual, you know, very purposeful. Just seen Wilkinson and Dawson around that top mark, just ahead of Japan 408, Kachimoto and Cup. Kawata getting around that top mark and then closely followed by Austria 3. You can see that on your screen. Having a little bit of a duel with Gimson and Burnett. They've both underlaid so they're having to do attack there. Um, also in the running is Lynn St. Holt and CP Lubeck. So that's the three boats on the screen. Well, that's a pretty slick double tack if I've ever well, seen yeah, one by the Austrians. But it's expensive and I'd expect to see maybe next come into – will be outreach outreach. And outreach. Now, how did they manage the top end of the course? It could op open up opportunity. You can see how slow the exit is for the top mark there for, um, for Lubeck. We saw Sinholt and Lubeck. Outreach and Outreach get a little bit more gas from the GBR team on your screen – um, they got more dirty air going into that top mark. So def being the race leaders, everyone's keeping an eye on them and kind of tucking them away when they can. And, and it proved to be quite a difficult upwind for the Aussies, but they should be next around that top mark now. I think it's really impressive to see Wilkinson. You know, he was back with Outeridge and he's worked his way up through the They've fleet. They've obviously got good pace and that, mm. they've found something because, you know, two months, three months ago in Auckland, they, they didn't look as slick as they look here. Wilkinson's interesting. He comes from a, a non-sailing background. He used to race go-karts. Mm. And, and the family, I, I was lucky enough to have dinner with them last night. Mm. They're, you know, they, they're very matter-of-fact. They're not from Auckland. Very, uh, they're from the Waikato or uh, Hamilton in New Zealand. Mm. And his passion as a kid was go-karts. Well, he's got this go-kart wound up at the moment. And these guys have only been sailing for a few weeks before the Auckland regatta. Like, the whole team was absolutely uh, tipped on its head. Everyone's reshuffled. Um, we've seen uh, the main team of Gemma Jones and Jason Saunders split into two boats. But Mika, who's now steering, he was a crew for Olivia. And so these guys are all in different combinations, all in different positions. And whilst we might not be seeing that um, standout result, although we are with Mika at the moment, you know, he's right in the money. But these, guys, these teams are going to take a little bit of time to uh, sort out their um, team dynamics and, and how the boat's going to operate. But I'm expecting to see some really sharp sharp improvements from the Kiwis as they get a little bit more used yeah, to the combinations. It, 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 it's, it's, yeah, it's certainly been a talking point within the New Zealand yachting circles, the whole dynamic in the, in the NACRA fleet. What I like about it is a whole bunch of them are really young. Mm -hmm. And um, just to see them enjoying their yachting, they're going out there and doing it. And the, I wonder in terms of New Zealand, and it's one to you guys really because you know, I'm from there, is... Do you think there's a, a flow-on effect from, you, you look at 
Burling and Took, who really are the, the, the poster boys of New Zealand yachting. Do you think it's rubbing off on some of these young sailors? Oh, absolutely. A, a nation needs a hero, you know, and if young sailors have, um, you know, these guys that they can look up to and, and really aspire to be something like that, it's infectious, you know, and, and we in Australia saw it uh, with some great successes in the last Olympics and the amount of kids flocking to sailing now, you know, it, it really does help at that grassroots level. Good shot. I just can't quite pick up who that is. It might be our race leaders, I think. Bracey and and we watched we, we, our previous aerial showed Austria and Japan. They'll be coming down towards the finish, so uh, they just went past the gate. Coming in nice and hot to the finish, Austria 391 uh, will be our race leaders, Perezi and Zolchig. These guys are in sixth gear, in my, in my <laughs> opinion. They've found an extra gear. They are a little bit faster on the upwind, but it's the Italians. We know they, they're, they're quick on the downwind. Um, Bizarro and Frascari, Tita and Banti are hot on their heels. I think that they have the slight speed advantage on the downwind as they come through the finish line. So it was Italy 5, Vittorio, Bizarro and Frascari. Uh, and then Italy 26, Tita and Banti are in a third position there. Really tight. A speed advantage for the Austrians, maybe upwind. A speed advantage for the Italians, most definitely on the downwind. We've seen that uh, for the majority of this year. And it does look like uh, Mika Wilkinson and Erica Dawson will be in fourth place. Um, they will be the next boat. But there is quite a gap. And these guys are receiving some heat. It is really close. Um, between fourth and perhaps eighth position coming in. And you can see that uh, line on your screen of those spinnakers coming in. Um, and whoever's picked the best angle, you know, uh, you want to be a little bit lower on, uh, well, I guess, to the right of the screen because then you might be able to pick up a little bit more speed with a better angle. Uh, but it does look like the pressure is pretty hot uh, just to the left of the screen with that white spinnaker. It's going to be close. It's, uh, certainly, this is pretty exciting. As they come down towards the finish, who's it going to be? It's right down at the boat end. It looks like the blue spinnaker just goes over. So that's the New Zealanders. And there's uh, Austria the to Austrian. windward and the uh, Japanese team right in the middle. But that was close. But Micah Wilkinson used his go-kart skills <laughs> to just take it to get the fourth position uh, for the New Zealanders. Then it was... Uh, it would be GBR then in seventh place and then Denmark 71 in eighth and Australia 46. I had a really good downwind there coming in in ninth place. Uh, what a shake-up. We're seeing some real changes in these results as we're going uh, around the fleet, especially when they condense in those packs like that. It really keeps the racing interesting. 